In the modern world, we face challenges to our Catholic faith every day. But how do we respond with love and the truth? Today, we'll explore how to give the Catholic answers that our family members, neighbors, and culture need with our special guest, Catholic apologist and author, Patrick Madrid. I'm Father Michael Scanlon, President Emeritus of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. We're talking about apologetics, and we have a regular panelist here with us, Dr. Regis Morton, our professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, a professor of biblical theology. And our special guest, Patrick Madrid, author of many books, including Search and Rescue and How to Bring Your Family and Friends Into or Back Into the Catholic Church. Apologetics a word used a lot, frequently misunderstood. Uh, exactly what do we mean by apologetics? Are we apologizing for anything? No, Father. Okay. <laughs> As you might have guessed. What a relief. Yes. Uh, many people surprisingly do have that misconception yeah. that, uh, that our modern use of the word apology, meaning I regret something, yeah. I, I wish it hadn't happened, that they think that apologetics means that we have that attitude, when in fact apologetics actually means the opposite. It's a way of engaging in the, uh, the art of overcoming people's objections to say, here's why I believe what I believe. Here are the reasons for what I believe as a Catholic. It's not argumentative. It's not um, certainly not apologizing for being Catholic. It's not mean-spirited. It's not defensive. When it's done properly, it's a, a very a reasoned and charitable and patient exposition of why we believe what we believe. And how did you get involved in doing this? <laughs> Gosh, where do I start on that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you needed a uh, job. <laughs> yes, well, it, th there's truth in that. Actually, yeah. I, I'll tell you the, the, the simplified version. I, yeah. um, I had a reconversion. I, I'm a cradle Catholic. Okay. So for my whole life, uh, always Catholic, never tempted to leave the Catholic Church. Uh, but, you know, like many young people, I went through a time of lukewarmness when I was in my late teens and into my early 20s. And it all kind of caught up with me in my mid-20s. And I experienced a sort of a year-long reconversion experience, very, very, uh, a lot of turmoil and a lot of uh, wow. soul-searching. And it, it culminated in the final month or so of that, uh, I was going to uh, the local parish near where I worked, and I'd make a holy hour on my lunch break, and I'd pray the yeah. rosary and pray before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, asking Him to show me what He wanted me to do with, with my life. Good. And I wasn't getting much of an answer, um, and so I decided to take matters into my own hands, which is usually never a good idea, and <laughs> I quit my job very abruptly. And uh, I came home, told my wife that Friday, I've quit my job, I'm waiting to see what God Oh What's my! Do? Yeah. So you quit first before you knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah, that was it's usually insane. going the other way, right? <laughs> yes. Well, what happened was, uh, and Scott, you know this story. Sure. Uh, the following morning, uh, a friend of mine uh, happened to call, and we would talk on the phone every few weeks. And he happened to call that day, and. So what's going on? He was interested in apologetics, as was I. Oh. And as a lawyer, he was uh, much more involved than I was just sort of dabbling in it. And uh, I said, by the way, I'd like you to pray for me because I, I'm trying to discern God's will for my life, and I don't know where he wants me to go, but I've quit my job, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. He said, well, I can do something better than that. He said, I'll pray for you, but he says, I'm going to close down my law practice and start a full-time Catholic yeah. apologetics organization. Wow. Why don't you come work with me? This is Carl Keating. Yeah. Oh, oh Carl. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is how Catholic right. Answers started. Right. Nice. Yeah. It was a divine and providential it, moment. It was. That's all I can call it. This was more than 20 years ago. Oh, it was 25 years yeah, ago. In the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. In the 80s. Oh, this, was, uh, this is when apologetics had basically died. Oh, and then almost single-handedly, our Lord resurrected it through Carl, yes. Keating, and Pat oh, Madrid, yeah. and Catholic Answers. Because Mainly through Carl, I would say. In those days, he was the one who was sure. writing the book and the newsletter and all that. Yeah, it was a kind of Batman and Robin yeah, that's thing. True, that's <laughs> true. I encountered them in the late 80s, shortly yeah. after I came into the church. We were talking on the phone 
all about apologetics and scripture and this kind of thing. And I just kind of assumed you'd been around, you know, later yeah. on that I discover well, yeah. that, uh, no, this was really kind of divinely jump-started. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, if we have some real senior members out there, we remember apologetics was Bishop Sheen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Fulton right. Sheen right. was but the that, only one out there. That's a good point, though, the, because, uh, you know, answers. Archbishop Fulton Sheen was winning Emmys back in the 50s, right? Oh, yeah. And after Vatican II concluded in 1965, almost overnight, apologetics died. It yeah. was no longer being offered anywhere in yeah. colleges or seminaries in the early 70s. Right. And so when we're talking about the late 80s, we're really talking about something that needed to be more than just reinvigorated. It right. needed to be raised from the dead because yeah. a lot of people just saw this as preconciliar, well, you know, triumphalistic. Uh, we got a lot of that. Yeah. We yeah. got, this was apologetics before apologetics was cool. Right, right. Well, you guys made a big splash, but you had a lot to overcome. I think Scott adverts to that mm -hmm. uh, in the post-conciliar world. I think apologetics uh, came to be viewed as, as sort of a fifth wheel. We don't need it. Well, Plus, there's a lot to be embarrassed about mm -hmm. uh, 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 when you think yeah, of the, the faith. Don't be reactionary. We're yeah. Vatican II. Yeah. Or triumphalistic. At, at that point, yeah. they really yeah. were apologizing for some distinctive yeah. beliefs right. that we had as Catholics. But you know, when you ask the question about apologetics, it comes from you know, the term apologia, which yeah. is a Greek term that is in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense you know, for the hope that lies within you whenever anybody asks of you. Mm -hmm. But apologia was also a kind of rhetorical form back in the ancient world where you would give a very clear and logical and rhetorically persuasive defense of right, whatever it right. was. You know, yeah. Justin Martyr, for example, in the second century is one of the great apologists because he's giving an apologia for a Jew as well as for a, a Roman. To the and, emperor. Yeah, to the yeah. emperor. <coughs> and so I, I think it's crucial for us to see that this is not only something that goes way back to the roots of our faith, but it was something that was really common to people who had beliefs and had to give reasons. Right. But the key is that so many of us grew up with the idea that you needed to be specialized. You know, you needed yeah. some special training or special thing. You shouldn't just jump in and try to... Well, well, you need two no, things, and, and I'm sure that you are superbly qualified uh, uh, in both areas. A, you need to love your faith. Fall in love with, with Christ. Yeah. Be passionate about uh, the beliefs that uh, define a Catholic Christianity. And, and B, you need to know something about yeah. the faith, schooled uh, in the doctrines of, of the faith, the sacred deposit. That's a, an excellent point. Uh, not that he was a particularly uh, systematic theologian, but Henry Ford <clears throat> once said, uh, no, sorry, Thomas Edison once said uh, that enthusiasm is a great engine, but it needs knowledge for fuel. Right, and, yeah. and I've often thought about that, how our enthusiasm is good, but it needs to be informed enthusiasm. Right. Yeah, you know, Gilles Sohn has a great line about the Gothic cathedrals of Northern Europe, which sort of represent a lance aimed at the heart of God. He said, they were the happy combination of piety and geometry. Mm -hmm. I mean, piety alone isn't going to build a thing, mm -hmm. but geometry without faith, without piety, would build the wrong thing. So yeah. you need a felicitous uh, let mixture. Me, let me throw in one more quote, and that is mm -hmm. the, the apologist Ronald Knox in his study on enthusiasm said oh, that yeah. enthusiasm by itself never accomplished anything. And yet on the other hand, nothing is ever accomplished without enthusiasm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so we really do need to fall in love yeah. with our faith. At the same <clears> time, we also have to sharpen our reason. Mm -hmm. Because apologetics is really the coordination of both yeah. the supernatural gift of faith, but also the natural light of human reason, and that's what I think you do so well as Carl Keating, you know, in all of Catholic Answers yeah. too. So how do you get to know enough in order to be qualified to be a, an apologist? Well, yeah, Let take me, it away. As a, as a cradle Catholic, I'll offer a thought, but I'd love to hear the converse perspective. Yeah, sure. um, all Catholics uh, are called upon to be apologists. Yeah. And as, Saint, or as uh, uh, Scott quoted, uh, St. Peter's uh, admonition is for everybody. So it doesn't have to be uh, sophisticated, it doesn't have to be elaborate, yeah. but it, it has to be authentic and from the heart. And so the housewife, the, the butcher, the baker, the yeah. candlestick maker, anybody can engage in apologetics. If right. you want to go uh, into deeper territory or maybe engage in debates, I think that's where uh, a deeper knowledge is necessary. But I wouldn't want to give the impression that people have to sit back and wait for Scott Hahn to do apologetics or wait for someone else to but do it. But they can always do it from their own personal 
belief experience. Yeah. This is right. what changed yeah. my life. This is what made the difference. This, these are the truths of the faith that really, because nobody can argue right. with how something changed you right. and what was important. They can only argue if you're trying to say something for everybody I else. Mean, your, your life has, has a uniqueness which nobody else can uh, right. replicate. Uh, and everybody, I mean, any baptized person is obliged mm -hmm. uh, to make a defense of the faith, the hope yes. that is in him. Uh, and your case. life, I think, is the first apology that you offer. I mean, your, your behavior will probably be the only Bible most of your neighbors read. And if it's not exemplary, then what is there about Christianity to commend it to people who might otherwise be interested? They're turned off, mm -hmm. they're repelled. Yeah. I think well, it's significant, you know, that when Peter speaks about how we should always be prepared to give this defense, uh, when everybody, whenever anybody asks us to explain the hope that is within us, he adds with gentleness and reverence, right. you know, Verse in the 16. RSV, yeah. And, and so we ought to approach it, yeah. not in order to win an argument, but to win a potential brother or sister in Christ. And so apologetics and evangelization are distinct but inseparable. Yeah. And so often, you know, apologetics is sort of the pre-evangelization that is necessary to kind of clear away the obstacles, the impediments. And this is why classically, I mean, going back 150 years or so to the, the middle of the 19th century after the French Revolution, you really had three distinctive stages of apologetics. First, you had to be prepared to demonstrate the existence and attributes of God. And you could fall back upon St. Thomas Aquinas' five ways or Pascal's wager or whatever. But besides that, you also had to do something that would explain how God not only exists and has these perfect attributes, but how his presence is known, how his activities are manifest. So the historical credibility of Christianity is built upon the belief in God. And then the third stage was Catholic Christianity, where you're not just showing the historical grounds for Christ's divinity and his miracles, but then you're also showing that it's his intention to build the church and to empower the church with his own grace and authority so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So those three stages are, you can, see, you can hear why, you know, if you're talking to atheists or if you're talking to believers in God but not Christianity or if you're talking to Protestants who aren't Catholic, you know, you really want to be prepared yeah. to give a witness to lead them along closer right. and closer. But to the, that's right. the particular focus we have are those that have been active as Catholics and now have drifted away or decided away. And the question is, <clears throat> you know, how do we approach them? How do we get to the brethren who are now separated even mm -hmm. though they weren't at one point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the... Uh, well, that's the new evangelization. I mean, evangelizing yeah. the baptized, evangelizing the de-Christianized, you know. But again, you, you really can't do that without apologetics. No, you can't. And uh, I would say that, uh, as you well know, that uh, our apologetics uh, need is also among the people who are in the pews every Sunday. Yeah. So many of them have, uh, have lost uh, a real true sense of Catholic identity. And for many of them, they, they're there by habit. And right. they, they, they love God, but they don't really understand the teachings of the church. And there are reasons why. I mean, uh, lack of catechesis, uh, there have been all sorts of problems along the way. But uh, I see apologetics uh, as not only recovering, as, as I talk about in the book, not only recovering those who have left, but also to preemptively right. uh, yeah. prepare those inoculate. before, inoculate, right, so, right. so they won't wind up being another statistic. Now, a lot of people blame Vatican II you know, all this new stuff came in and it was too much and, and we lost all, all these people and we lost the simple Baltimore Catechism uh, approach that gave us clarity, clear answers and, and the rest. And it, but you know, with the passage of time, it becomes a little more difficult to demonize Vatican II. It was sure. a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that canard becomes rather tiresome, and, especially and, when you hear it from people who weren't even alive right. during uh, the Second uh, Vatican. Uh, uh. I was a kid when, the, when the, uh. ch the changes in the Mass, for example, in the mid-60s. But I have a theory on, on uh, why Vatican II is an easy target for many people. They forget, of, they forget all the other things that were going on at the time. We had you know, World War I, World War II, 
the Korean War. We had um, the Cold War with the Soviet Union, people building bomb shelters in their backyards, the Cuban Missile Crisis, three traumatic assassinations, JFK in 63, right. yeah. RFK and, and Martin Luther King in 68. Yeah. We had the Vietnam. drug revolution, Vietnam. Uh, we had the, the uh, ready access to television. Woodstock. Contraception. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, right. it, there was right. such, yeah. a, a such a disorient. It sounds like a nightmare. It really does. And then in the midst of all this, Holy Mother Church decides that it right. would be the opportune time to have a council. Well, I yeah. think just human nature being what it is, it's no wonder people right. were so right. discombobulated. After Vatican II, but not because of Vatican II. No, no, right. right. Yeah. It was a convulsive. Oh, and they okay. took advantage of a lot of, of those right. things. That, yeah. Well, when we come back, we want to talk about where's the proper role about <clears throat> dissent and what does it lead to and uh, we had all the confusion after Vatican II and people disagreeing with this new thing that was happening and others holding on so how do we have a healthy approach to this and not end up atheists or something along the way stay with us If you could perhaps think of a kiddie pool, that's atheism. It's shallow. Catholicism is like an ocean. It's vast, it's broad, it's expansive, and it is deep. The waves that are crashing on the shore can throw you all different kinds of directions, but you're always going to stay in the ocean. You're always going to be going out further and further and finding new and exciting things. My name is Michael Villanueva. I'm majoring in philosophy and theology. Last semester I had sacraments with Dr. Han. And uh, I'll tell you right now, it was the best class of my entire life. A every class, I'm just knocked out of my chair. It hits me like a ton of bricks. The beauty of the truth that he's speaking to us. Something so simple, God's but so beautiful and so profound and so powerful. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back. We're here with our regular panelists, Dr. Scott Hahn and Dr. Regis Martin, and our special guest, Patrick Madrid. And we're talking about Catholic apologetics. Patrick, let's talk about dissent. That's a difficult area, you know. Um, dissent within the Catholic Church. Why do people, people openly reject some of the teaching, then claim that they're fully Catholic and faithful. Mm -hmm. I've <laughs> often wondered why they do that, because uh, I couldn't do that. Uh, if I didn't want to operate according to the rules of the organization, yeah. I, would, I would leave. But many people insist on staying, and I think there are some reasons behind that. Some are, in, they want to be agents of change, and they have this idea that if they stay in and agitate from the inside, like w women who want to uh, see yeah. the church uh, ordain women to the priesthood. Yeah. They feel as that if they stay and agitate, they'll be able to change things from the inside. And you'll even hear them say, it's just a matter of time and we're gonna get this change. Right. That was the position, I, I think, that Rosemary Radford Ruther took. Mm -hmm. uh, ah. uh, when people would press her on the question, why don't you just get out? Yeah. You're so utterly unreconciled mm -hmm. with the teachings of the church. And she would oftentimes reply, well, why should I leave? You have the Xerox machines. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if I want to promote a rebellion, this is ah. the best place yeah. to oh do my, it. You have the bureaucracy. Let me co-opt it. That's a little that's more the, active than... <laughs> that's very yeah. cynical. Yeah. But I think it pinpoints the change that occurred after Vatican II, again, but not because of Vatican II, uh, because the political upheavals that changed society in the late 60s, you have people politicizing the church yeah. and the faith mm -hmm. and just saying, okay, unless you can prove it by reason and convince you know, the majority of people, then this belief is going to have to be up for grabs. And know? unless the majority of people wind up believing it, it not, right. not just to convince them, but there, there has to be that uh, that majority rules, uh, there's a mindset that if enough people sign this petition that says you got to get rid of this doctrine, then you're right. obligated to do you so. You know, there's a confusion between the sense of the faithful and the majority. Right. You know, because sometimes yeah. the sense of the faithful might be a minority, mm -hmm. but they're holding fast to the faith, whereas a majority get caught up in the cultural currents, you know, yeah. and carry it along. Well, we had never had what developed after Vatican II publications with the headline Catholic, right. calling themselves Catholic and then right. disagreeing and dissenting with the teaching. Yeah. 
in the Catholic Church. That was very confusing to the traditional Catholic who was used to just picking up something and having it reinforced. Right. And having newspapers with the name Catholic in their, exactly. in their title right. that actively uh, seek to undermine the teachings of the church. You know, after Vatican II, when apologetics left, what replaced it was a new discipline that wasn't entirely novel, but it was really new in the sense that it was now being required. It was called fundamental theology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what was caught, taught right. in the colleges and the seminaries. And a man named Ratzinger did it extraordinarily uh -huh. well. He did. In the 50s before Vatican II and then in the 60s and 70s because most of the people doing fundamental theology were doing it in a way that was sort of like opening the doors to other religions so that if you're a sincere Buddhist or Hindu, you can be saved. Right. And Ratzinger was saying, no, we've got to clarify something right. here. Because on the one hand, you know, fundamental theology really gives a foundation for apologetics by showing that there is no rational demonstration for any of the mysteries of faith, or they uh, wouldn't be mysteries. Right. We have to uh, accept the mysteries of faith by faith. Mm -hmm. There's no rational demonstration. On the other hand, yeah. there still is a rational justification for making the act of faith. Yeah. You can show through miracles and prophecy yeah. that God is present. Yeah, it's not blind faith. God is present and active in Jesus. And so if God has said something, it's not unreasonable to believe it just because you can't prove it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so fundamental theology, the way Ratzinger and a few others were doing it, yeah. really kind of Good. opened the doors and made it possible to renew apologetics so that we weren't pretending to be able to prove the mysteries of faith, right. but we were showing how reasonable it is mm -hmm. to make the act of faith. But right. once you make yeah, the yeah. act of faith, yeah. dissent is against that act. Mm -hmm. yeah, so where's the problem today in terms of which teachings uh, are they dissenting from? Which teachings are now Well, you know, I, I would, I would propose edge. this, uh, that at two distinct levels uh, we have apostasy uh, or serious systemic yeah. dissent. Uh, at the moral level, uh, you have people who are utterly disaffected from mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. and they feel themselves driven out because the church is holding positions which strike them as bigoted, benighted, uh, like or scandals. Old. Yeah, the, the, the clergy sex abuse scandal or hypocritical. Uh, uh, infuriates them, and they insist that until the church cleans house, I'm out of here. This somehow undermines the Eucharist. Or the it, whole integrity of faith is subverted by these aberrations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can deal with those people, but at another level, and this is deeper and I think more mysterious and, and insidious, are people who in the very face of God having become man uh, can't abide it. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Uh, why did God make the world in the first place? And why did he send his son, uh, y y the incarnation? This gives them pause. It, it, it's too generous. It's too much. And, and so they slink away uh, and, and they are almost impossible to retrieve. Mm -hmm. So no, I think, not impossible. Uh, no, not yeah, impossible, yeah. but grace. Right. Grace has Humanly to move them. Impossible. So a genuine apologetical style, I think, has got to include both sets of dissenters. When there's time, I'll, I'd like to share a story with you that I think illustrates the point that you're making. Uh, time. time. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> I was speaking at a conference, and uh, I was uh, signing books at the book table, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye there was a woman that had a very uh, unhappy look on her face. She was scowling, scowling at me, scowling at the books, scowling at the people. When I finished signing the books, I said hello to her, and she said, don't even try it. I said, what? She said, don't try to convert me. I, well, yeah. I'm, I'm an ex-Catholic. I hate the Catholic Church. We were talking about how yeah. so many ex-Catholics have a, a mm -hmm. deep bitterness. And, and she, I said, well, why do you hate the Catholic Church? So she started rattling off a series of, of well, yeah. you worship statues, and the Pope is not infallible, and the wafer, and all this. And so I was prepared to kind of crush those arguments. I, I felt like the gunslinger who was reaching, right. in, but instead of a six-shooter, I was reaching for my Bible. You know, I was going yeah. to go right. after it. Right. But I had, a, I had an intuition saying, just be quiet. Right. And so I, I bit my tongue and I didn't say anything and she continued. And after a few minutes, she ran out of steam. So then she, she was calm enough that we could sit down and chat for a while. And I said, well, you said you were an ex-Catholic. What happened? So she, she went from being this ferocious, uh, angry person to within a matter of a few minutes, she was, yeah. she was sobbing as she yeah. told me the story of how uh. 19 years old she got pregnant. She couldn't get any help from anybody. Uh. A local priest didn't help her. 
her boyfriend talked her into an abortion and she, she said that she hated that priest. And then she said, and then I hated the Catholic Church. So she didn't know where to direct these emotions that she was feeling. Yeah. The Catholic Church became the object of her anger. Yeah. And then she left the church and for the next 15, 20 years she was bitterly yeah. anti-Catholic. I, I didn't know what to say to her. So all I could think of when she was at the, at the deepest part of this uh, story was yeah. I said, you need to go to confession. Yeah. She was angry with me for saying that. Sure. Like, how dare you tell me to? Right, right. So six, eight weeks later, I got an email from her. I had forgotten all about her. And she said, you were right. I need exactly. to go to confession. Yeah. Right. And she yeah. came back. And what happened was is ah. she was so estranged and so angry, but that a little, a little phrase, a little word, a gentle word, and uh, I thought I was being really ridiculous by saying that in the first place, but that's what God used to bring her home. So People. instead of her being really a dissenter, she was... Struggling, wounded, She's wounded yeah. Yeah. and uh, trying to find some platform to stand on. Yeah. You know, there's something that. else that's happened here since Vatican II. Besides the development of fundamental theology, some of which went the wrong direction, but what Ratzinger and others mm -hmm. have done went in the right direction. As a result of taking fundamental theology and apologetics and bringing them back together again, I think what we've discovered is this new dimension of apologetics that is the logic of divine love the beauty of the truth, mm -hmm. where people look at that and realize, it, you know, as you were saying a minute ago, Regis, the incarnation, it's too good to be true, right. except it is. Right. Well, if, if, if it is true, and if the Holy Spirit opens the heart through prayer, and not necessarily the person praying for mm -hmm. himself or herself, but for you know, our praying for them, when that, when that opening occurs, suddenly you begin to revisit that truth and realize that it may have seemed too good to be true, but it is true, precisely because my needs are so great. Mm -hmm. And the medicine of mercy is going to have to really work deeply okay. in my heart. And suddenly the truth becomes beautiful and compelling to the heart and not just the head. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's an important addition that has come to well, apologetics. The, um, I agree. Well, the, you know, the thing we're dealing with now is a radical atheism. You know, a kind Militant of... Militant atheism. Rather, yeah, you know, rather than just saying, well, I can't accept the Pope or i not don't believe the Eucharist or something like this as yeah. the reason to pull away. Uh, we're having a whole move of radical atheism. No, no God. But it's, it's oftentimes it a, a will to atheism. It's not so much an operation of, of the intellect oh, as if they yeah. had neatly cataloged yes. all the arguments and they come up empty. There can't be a God. Right. Or if there is, he's malevolent and the church is obscene. That, that's not the result of, mm -hmm. of arguing. They're not thinking their way into atheism. It's a movement of the will. First they resolve uh, against God, then they shore up the arguments uh, right. to bring him down. You it's know, just true. as apologetics prepares people to be evangelized, there's almost a sense in which the new atheism is the apologetic to kind of evangelize people in moral relativism. And if they're predisposed toward relativism, right, right. they're going to be eagerly embracing this new atheism of Dawkins and Hitchens and, right. and Harris and, and others, you know. But on the other hand, you want to identify people like Anthony Flew, mm -hmm. who, you know, back in the 70s when I was an undergraduate, was a terrifyingly brilliant philosopher and an atheist. Mm -hmm. And when I read him, you know, he would really claim to be open-minded, open to the evidence, philosophically, right. scientifically, but at the same time, pretty convincing. The irony is that in the last 10 years since the emergence of the new atheism, it, with Dawkins, mm -hmm. you know, the God delusion, comes the conversion of Anthony Flew, not to Christianity, but to a full, philosophically informed belief in God. Right, a theism. Yeah, right. in theism, yeah. an right. infinite God. Yeah. You, right. know? And you know what the new, the new uh, atheists say about him is they say, oh, well, he was senile at that oh, point. He, right. he, he was no longer competent. To, he, he had lost his philosophical yeah. edge. What he was was honest. Yeah, because, I mean, but he they was can't have that. They that's can, right. They cannot accept that as a possibility. Yeah, he debated William Lane Craig and a number oh. of other people mm -hmm. over the course of decades. And not only were they compelling, but they were charitable toward him. Yeah. And in his interviews, he testified that the arguments over the course of the, the, the last 20 years with DNA and with the, advan the, the advances in science, the, the arguments just became more convincing. Right. Right. Yeah. And the people presenting them yeah. had integrity. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a, a good reminder for us. Yeah.
Craig is, a, is an excellent apologist. He for, sure is. You know, I, I, William Lane Craig. So, I mean, you know, you, you establish uh, the plausibility of there being a God, and then you ask yourself, okay, it's reasonable to believe uh, in this ultimate ground, this God. What about this God some, suddenly stepping outside of, of his eternal perfection and creating a world, and then inserting his son into that world, the incarnate God, to somehow redeem and deliver it? Uh, I mean, on the face of it, it looks incredible, impossible. Who can believe this? But you know what? This is something that nothing more would give me greater joy to believe was true. Mm -hmm. And if you can move people in that direction, yeah, then you have a eureka moment, you know, a wow moment. This is exactly the answer to all of my longing. This corresponds to the deepest desires of my art. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have a God who became uh, a man. And you can, I mean, we're talking about how to break f free from the materialism, consumerism, the total spin world that is going on uh, that, that eliminates God as a presence and an answer, yeah. and that we have to liberate, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Uh, on yeah. the one hand, it's so seductive. On the other hand, it's so boring, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, and I think that's, that's the opening that we have to take advantage of. You know, as C.S. Lewis said, the man who gives into lust doesn't want too much. He's settling for too little. Yeah. You know, and, and that's consumerist yeah. culture uh, you know, yeah. in general. Well, when we come back, we want to talk about some practical responses that can work, to, that can move people forward from this pit yeah. that we're talking about. Stay with us. Professor Madrid in, the, in our apologetics class talks about how apologetics is not so much about winning an argument. It's what he calls it is he says it's a, a search and rescue mission, not a search and destroy mission. It's when it comes down to it, evangelization and apologetics is about love. It's about sharing the love and the truth that we have found in our faith and in Christ Jesus. It's about really just, it's not about winning an argument with every single perfect scripture verse perfectly placed, though that has its place. It's about coming together with another human being and showing them what we have found to be the truth. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back. We're here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, surrounded by our students here working all the equipment. We're here right on the campus with our regular panelists here who have an opinion on everything. <laughs> Scott Hahn and Regis Martin, and a good friend, Patrick Madrid, who indeed has been director of Envoy and has done great work in the whole area of apologetics. Thank you. Uh, and, and so we want to get to the more direct work, the more practical response of what do we do? when we're involved in apologetics. It may be family, it may be friends, business partners, whatever. It does, it's not something on a broad stage somewhere that they're televising. It's something intimate and personal. And uh, how should the normal faithful Catholic approach or see his role or her role in apologetics? Well, I, I think it all flows from the fact that God can convert the human heart, I can't. Yeah. I have a hard enough time understanding my own heart, so I, I'm not capable of converting anyone else's heart. Uh, but if we see that as uh, God's job, but our job is to collaborate with Him like the sower of the seed, uh, we have to be the ones who are speaking and acting yeah. and demonstrating, as, as uh, Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, let them see your good works and, and then it will give uh, glory yeah. to your Father who is in heaven. So we have to speak, yes, we have to act, we also have to know when it's time to be 
uh, quiet and and to not push somebody. Listen. So sometimes. To hear what, yeah. yeah, listen what's, to what they're what saying. What they're saying, yeah. so that you're responsive. Yeah, there's there's, there's yeah. always yeah. A, a certain Promethean temptation to think that oh I can do this, mm -hmm. I'm equal to this. I challenge. have had that, and I've succumbed to that temptation yeah. more than once. And, and the yeah. apologist, especially, I, I think, mm -hmm. needs to keep his his pretensions uh, yeah. fairly modest. This is finally God's work. Absolutely. There's another temptation Absolutely. too. It would be more like the ostrich, you know just to bury your head right, and to right. say, you know, don't, don't trouble me. Yeah, let somebody else do right. it. Right, whereas I think a lot of Catholics have discovered that when friends or family raise their questions or even think about leaving the church or announce that they have left the church, it becomes this divine opportunity for not only you to reach out to them, but for you to dig down deep for yourself and discover, okay, why do I believe? And then right, suddenly right. there's a great awakening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are good reasons, you know, yeah. and I've got to share them. But it calls for a certain degree of honesty. You know, if a family member asks you a question, you don't know the answer, admit it, you know, yeah, and then go in search of the answer. Because sometimes the honesty coupled with a, a cogent response is precisely what the human spirit responds yeah. to best. You know? the, the, yeah, the, the f simple, sometimes saying, well, I struggled right, with that right, question yeah. at a time. You know, I remember yeah. a time in my life when I just said, it's a host. What do you mean it's Jesus? Right. Or things like this. and. That just became an occasion to go deeper and open to grace so that I could yeah. have revealed to me. If, if <coughs> greater. I, I, I love that Portuguese <laughs> proverb about yeah. God writing straight with uh, crooked lines, crooked sure. pencils. I always and thought it was a Spanish proverb. <laughs> <laughs> My last name's would. Madrid, so we could have Yes. Well, Iberian, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll take and, that. And, and it is, I think, humbling to know that the guy who sort of founded uh, the art and the science of defending the Christian religion uh, has as his last name, Martyr, Justin Martyr. I mean, yeah. he, he, he yeah. failed spectacularly uh, with Marcus Aurelius, uh, uh, you know, whom, whom history has sort of elevated uh, to this, uh, this pantheon of humane, urbane uh, letters, mm -hmm. when in fact he was a butcher. And he was not impressed by the arguments that, uh, that Justin had, had marshaled, so he, he failed. Yeah. Uh, and yet, I mean, out of that failure, uh, a whole Catholic Christendom arose on the ruins of what had been seemingly a timeless uh, Roman Empire of classical antiquity. It simply self-destructed yeah. thanks to, you know, the, the, the blood of martyrs like Justin. It's an echo of uh, what happened on Calvary. The supreme failure yeah. on Calvary uh, is what won the war, yeah. and uh, right. yeah. very similar to that. You know, I, I think another dimension of, of, to answer your question, Father, on yeah. what are some practical things we can do. Uh, it's true we do need to know our faith well enough to articulate it. We need to know scripture. We need to know the truths of, of, of Christian history. But we also have to uh, not forget that human element, and sometimes it's as simple as saying, you can come back to the Catholic Church if you want to. Uh, I remember one man I, I spoke to at a conference I gave up in it was Flint, yeah. Michigan. I don't know why I remember it was Flint, Michigan. But he said that he had been bitterly anti-Catholic for as an ex-Catholic for over 30 years. And any time he could buttonhole a Catholic and, and give him the business, he would do it. Uh. And he said one day he was giving someone the business and the Catholic fellow didn't respond in kind. Uh, but he simply said, well, I don't know what to say to all that, but I can tell you that you can always come home to the Catholic Church. And he said that was like a, uh, uh. a ray of sunlight melting the ice around his heart. Yeah. He, that very day, he went <laughs> back to confession. Yeah. And the other fellow didn't have any elaborate arguments. He had no arguments, but, but the, the logic of love uh, was what it took to, to get this yeah. guy to come Yeah, home. we'll keep the light on for you. Yes. Yeah, well, you can yes. keep, yeah. to say, well, you can keep talking about the things that you can't figure out and have them, you can't put all together, and that's fine. But you can, you come back and you pray and you get grace work and the, the Holy Spirit and the and the rest of it, and you're going to get to the clarity. But don't wait till you have everything lined up first in your head before you move back to the grace, right. the sacraments, right. yeah. and the. Praise. You know, it, it, we know this from experience of other areas of life that the best defense sometimes is a good offense, you know, mm -hmm. and not to be offensive, but to be constructive, yeah. you know, to, not to destroy the arguments so much as to construct better ones that are convincing, but also attractive, mm -hmm. you know, and to do it in a way that you, you, you share the fact that you enjoy the truth. Right. Uh, and I find that, 
You know, we know the statistics that tens of millions of Catholics in America have left the church, but at the same time that they went to these Bible Christian fellowships and independent denominations or whatever, you know, there's, there's now a kind of opposite movement because, uh -huh. you know, now there's a recovery in the church of the biblical roots mm -hmm. of our faith. And, you know, we're seeing literally, you know, over a thousand ministers and missionaries coming back you know, and at the same time, tens of thousands of right. ex-Catholics, yeah. you know, reading returning. the Bible and then returning with the evangelical zeal, you know, that goes back to their, you know, when they left the church and they found Jesus, now they found the church that yeah, Jesus they founded. I, Which is exciting. It is. But there's also the slippery slope, though, the lapsed one that nothing's engaging yeah. at this point, you know, oh, I've mm. just... It, they don't have clear reasons or clear stand, and, and that can be tough to reach out to. And some of them don't want, uh, they're not operating at a rational level. Yeah. It, it's uh, usually, an, for that kind of person, it's more of an appetite issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to give appetite. up this right. thing right. that I yeah. want. Right. If I give this up, I'll be unhappy. Therefore, I just will leave the church. Yeah. I've met so many people. It doesn't people scratch where I itch. Yeah, you know, yeah I'm not. Um, and and uh -huh. many of the times it's a uh, sexual issue. Sometimes it's just sheer inertia. Right. They just don't want to be bothered, right. you know, and, uh -huh. and we have to contend with that as well. Yeah, there, there is one antagonist out there. It's called spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as if the word became an idea mm -hmm. uh, and not flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, a movie, the movie that Martin Sheen was in uh, called The Way. Mm -hmm. uh, his son dies mm -hmm. uh, in the film and he sprinkles his ashes along the way to the shrine of St. James in Compostela. Uh, but it's spiritual, it's not religious, it's not Catholic, mm -hmm. it's not the way, it's a way, something amorphous, indefinite, which strikes me as utterly irrelevant, completely boring. Mm -hmm. Who would be interested in mere spirituality when you can eat the bread of life? Mm -hmm. And why turn your back uh, on the one institution that uniquely confects God himself? You can have him as a meal. Mm -hmm. I think and it does democratize religion in a way that many people find appealing. It's do it yourself. Yeah. You know, spirituality is just sort of like self-help plus religion, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're picking yourself up by your own bootstraps and finding others of like right. mind, you know. And, and it and doesn't... creating a genre, you know, right. you're reading books on spirituality. Right. And it imposes no demands. That's it's right. what Ratzinger yeah. used to call bourgeois Christianity. The right. comfort zone yeah. is, is vast. And you're right, it's do it yourself salvation. Yeah. And who would be willing to die for that? Right. I right. wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Or live but for you it. Can, yeah. there, there are so many out there that don't take issue, just slide away. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, I'm not going to state exact reasons because then right. people are going to come back with answers right. for me and <laughs> right. this yeah. stuff. So yeah. I'm just saying, uh, it doesn't impress me. I'm not imp Right. You know, the Gospels, the Gospels are full of stories of people who are taken by surprise by Jesus. You know, Zacchaeus, right. you know, he yeah. hadn't done a, a, a study program. You know, he just wanted to see this guy and he's yeah. hanging up in a sycamore tree, you know. Then suddenly he ends the day by being justified as a, a, a yeah. reconciled sinner. I think the same thing's happening all around us. And that's why I, I love not just Search and Rescue, but a lot of your books, you know, bring in the rational arguments and yet also the biblical truth. Yeah. where you're encountering Jesus and you're encountering him in the church along with others and the saints and that sort of thing. And, and to me, that's what's so useful because when you discover the Bible is the word of God in the Catholic church. And I remember, you know, as a Protestant, the Bible was my map yeah. to get from here to heaven. You know, it's like MapQuester, Google <laughs> Maps. You know, when I came into the church, it's like a GPS. There's a living voice. You, you know, are here. Right? There's a heavenly orientation right. from above, you know, yeah. and, you know, recalculating. Because I make mistakes when I read the Bible. It's nice to yeah. have an authority from on high guiding me home, you know. Yeah. And so when you proclaim the Word of like God that. from within the tradition, it's so alive. Even if you can't prove that it's alive, it already strikes the heart and the right. mind that way. You know what I've noticed, and you probably have read a lot of this too, uh, as, as have you, I'm sure, Regis, and that is that uh, the, the Protestant apologists are well aware of that. 
Yeah. And they don't like it because, and they'll, I just read an article on an on a apologetic, apologetics website uh, just recently, and they, they identify that very issue. The Catholics make a persuasive case. It's not true, they say, right. but it's persuasive and it appeals to Protestants, and they don't really know what to do about it. Right. 20 years ago, they wouldn't admit that. Right. But after 20 now, years, yeah. Yeah. Now they're just, they're, they're uh, perplexed, I think, and they're That's not right. sure what to do about and it. They're, and they're basically attributing it to rhetoric, you know, yeah. or to persuasive. They're clever. Yeah, smooth, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, it's the logic of love. I mean, as a Protestant, I believed in the good news. But when I became Catholic, the good news just got better. It wasn't feeling like I was just laid out by argumentation. Mm -hmm. That had a small role, but it was just believing more, not less. Not subtracting, yeah. but addition. Yeah. But what happens when you're going down there and suddenly they're quoting the priest, the sister, the Catholic teacher who sang the opposite. I get that a lot. Sure. And, yeah. uh, I do too. And it's a confusing moment there, you know. Uh, That's where the catechism can be so I, helpful. Uh, right. yeah. To say, you know, I understand that sister so-and-so may have said that, but let's see what the church says. Yeah. And right. to try to reorient people uh, back to that touchstone. Yeah, I point out when people ask me my opinion, I, I respond, you know, what difference does my right. opinion make? Right. You know, yeah. we're really talking what the church is teaching. And so if you've got, you know, a progressive or if you've got a traditionalist, you know, if they're just spouting opinions, well, they have the right to do right. that. Right. But they shouldn't confuse people, you know, when it comes to their opinions and the church's teaching. Just mm -hmm. distinguish those two things. One okay. final thing there that I've had to deal with so much in my life well, in the spirit of Vatican II, right. yeah. you know, we're moving on, we're moving away from this, and that's what, that was pre-Vatican, and that used to be in the Baltimore Catechism, but, but now still in the that. spirit oh. of Vatican II, and uh, it's like you're regressing, you're holding back and not coming along as we move ahead in the spirit of and uh, what's the best uh, launching pad against that one? Well, something you told me a few years ago. You know, back then, people wanted change. Don't be afraid of yes. change. And now that things are changing back and settling down, yeah. tell them, don't be afraid of change. Yeah. Uh, you know? yeah. Because it's the Holy Spirit who is bringing us back. Most of these people are on the cusp of the big change. They should be studying for their final exam. I mean, uh, the dissenters. There is a graying of dissent, right. no doubt. Yes. Yeah. 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 But I think the, the key is to take them back to the texts, the, 14, the 16 right. documents of Vatican II, yeah. and just say, you know, the letter and the spirit, they go together. Right. Okay. Yeah. But when we come back, we want to have some final thoughts that enable our viewers to say, oh, I can do that. I can move ahead and take the role God wants for me in a Catholic apologetics. Stay with us. I really like the verse, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, be prepared to give reason for the joy that's in you, because I really feel like that defines what apologetics is about. It's about being able to explain and defend the faith uh, to those who ask it of you. For as much as science can answer how and when, it cannot answer that most fundamental question that's just written on the human heart, and that is why. Uh, the church does that, theology does that, um, but atheism leaves unanswered. It leaves it cold. It leaves it uh, unanswered. It's not sufficient. And eventually, those who do trust in atheism, and those who do put their faith in atheism, it'll eventually peter out. It's not going to fulfill them. And so, for apologetics, we have to be able to explain our faith and be ready for those who are going to ask that purest and most innocent question, and that will be why. My name is Kelly Butler and I'm a communication arts major. I took independent digital filmmaking. Definitely intense. Many all-nighters in the editing lab getting things done. Pope John Paul II has a quote, Do not be afraid to go out into the streets and into public places to preach Christ like the first apostles. That's what we're called to as Catholics and as Christians. You have that responsibility that every work you create should reflect Christ. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. come to the last segment on Catholic apologetics with our special guest Patrick Madrid. There's a lot that can be said, but we'd like to give you some takeaway thoughts that will launch you in the direction that God wants you to do at this point in your life.
go. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was greatly struck by uh, something Scott said uh, at the end of that third session uh, about Zacchaeus. Uh, he's, he's a favorite character of mine in the New Testament. The guy is hiding in a tree uh, because he wants a bird's eye view of Jesus who suddenly appears and, and in a startling uh, 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 aside uh, tells Zacchaeus, look, I'd like to have supper with you, so would you please come down? And, and this, I think, goes right to the heart of, of what Christianity is. It's not a set of dogmas. It's not a series of moral precepts. Uh, it's an encounter, a, a meeting uh, between time and eternity, between man and God, and Jesus mediates uh, that wedding, that still point of the turning world. He wants to see us. He wants to enter our life and become a companion along the way. Uh, Giussani, many years ago, uh, in trying to identify the malaise in the post-conciliar church said, look, it's not a matter about a literal rehearsal of the message. Everybody knows the message. Uh, in, in fact, we, we moralize it all the time. What Christianity fundamentally is, is an encounter with the event of Christ. And if you don't have that encounter, then the temptation is to reduce all of it to abstractionism, to vaporize it, or to make it like anything else. And anything else is not enough to justify the sacrifice of, of one's life. And I always think of this uh, exchange that Flannery O'Connor had. Uh, uh, it, it's reproduced in, in that marvelous book of hers, The Habit of Being, her correspondence. This young woman is greatly entranced by the faith and she decides to become a Catholic. And then 10 minutes later, having met a few Catholics, yeah. she's disillusioned. And yeah. she tells O'Connor, look, I'm out of here. I can't take it. And the response that O'Connor gives, I think, is priceless. She says, look, the only thing that is going to make the terrible world we are coming to endurable is the church. But the only thing that makes the church endurable is that she is somehow the body of Christ, and on this body we are fed. Where else Boy. can you go except the church? Very true. Okay. And thank you for making that so engaging for so many years, for so many people. Yeah. Where else to go? I like that. Scott? Building on that, because, you know, you've been doing this now for decades. I mean, we go back to the late 80s, yeah. so our relationship, our friendship spans those decades, but You've been doing it in a way that has freed me up. Because I, I was often asked, come and give talks on apologetics. I'm like, get that, you know? But the, uh, I, I, it was biblical theology and reading the fathers that made me Catholic more than apologetics. But I was so grateful to have discovered Carl Keating and your partnership and now to see what you've been able to produce on a consistent basis that makes it personal. I mean, even if you can't have supper with Jesus like Zacchaeus did, yeah. You can in the Mass, and you can discover him through other people. And your series, Surprised by Truth, three volumes, you know, these are stories of people who've had that living encounter with the truth of Christ and discovering the church as their family. But not just that. I mean, I'm also thinking of Search and Rescue, which we've been talking about today. It's such a personal approach. And likewise, even the godless delusion that you did with uh, Ken Hensley, and then where is that in the Bible? Why is that in tradition? You go to envoyinstitute.net or patmadrid.com, your blog, and what you find is always not just the truth presented in a kind of abstract, compelling, logical way, but there's wit, there's beauty, there's personal stories, experiences, you know, strengths as well as weaknesses, you know. And, and I just want to say, keep it up, you know, yeah. keep up the great work because, uh, you know, we have you back again and again to defending the faith the last weekend in July for a reason. You're a permanent fixture yeah. because I, I really see that our Lord has, you know, passed the torch from Carl to Patrick and other people too. I don't want to, and Carl's still doing great work, but I'm just grateful to God and to you that uh, so many people have found so much mm -hmm. through your many, many works. Thank you, Scott. That's uh, pretty overwhelming. And thank you, Regis, for the kind remarks. I have to say, in all honesty, uh, what you are, uh, something like St. Augustine saying that when God crowns our merits, he's crowning his own work. Uh, yeah. you, you should r recognize uh, the reflection of your work in my work. Because, uh, to be totally honest with you, a great deal of, of my work is simply a, a retelling of the story that, as I learned it from my fathers in the faith, and I count you as one of them. 
So uh, there's wow. a lot, uh, a lot of, um, uh, as you said, continuity from one to the next. I'm passing tempted to down. say you can do better than me. <laughs> but keep, keep well, on. for better or for worse, I have learned a lot from you. So I, I do uh, seek to perpetuate the good that you've done. My um, my closing thoughts basically revolve around uh, the people who are watching the program, and I know that there are many people right now who are in distress because their grown son has left the church or because yeah. uh, their husband has left or something like that. So what I always try to key in on for people who are, are living this problem, the problem of not knowing how to explain and defend the faith, is to say, number one, you can do this. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to have elaborate uh, knowledge to be able to explain the faith. St. Peter's uh, statement that you quoted earlier, always be ready to give a defense yeah. to anyone who asks you. That applies to all of us. Everyone watching right now, that applies to them too. Verse 16, but do it with gentleness and respect. That is so key. So I would always add that proviso that no matter how much knowledge you may gain, no matter how skillful you may become, if it's bereft of charity and, and if it's not informed, informed by this uh, patience that's so necessary, we can do more harm than good. The last thing that comes to my mind is that uh, many people are saying, I have no idea where to begin. Well, that's where these books come in. That's where the Catholic Answers website comes in. That's where there's so many resources available now. Uh, it is, it's not difficult to get started. You just have to do a little bit of, of, of digging. You'll find the answers. They're there. There's nothing that can be raised against the, the Catholic Church that has not been answered many times over, over the years. And when people discover that, it's a very liberating feeling for them. And I think it gives them a lot of uh, encouragement to go forward. That's great, and thanks for your work on that. You know, you always can respond, this is what I believe, or this is why I believe. And let me tell you, uh, where I got fed, and where I found the truth, and let me re recommend to you books like Search and Rescue by Patrick Madrid, books that give the deeper answer but remember, you always have an answer. It's what you believe and what your experience has been. That's an adequate answer for the first stage of things. Then there's the second or third stage. Now do you want to go deeper? Do you really want to find the roots and understand? So you don't have to be a certified apologist from somewhere. That's right. You just have to be willing to share and to meet the people where they're struggling argument is. And today we, we will have a handout for you, an excerpt from this Search and Rescue by Patrick Madrid. And it starts out, we all make excuses. I love it. We all make excuses as to why we can't share in the faith. Well, we all can. We just have to do it within our own jurisdiction, within our own competency of what's real and true for us. But God bless you. Go forth. God's called us all into apologetics. Until next time, may the Lord bless and keep you, show his face to you, have mercy on you, turn his countenance to you, and give you his peace. May the Lord bless you, Father, Son, and Spirit.